Okay, welcome back under the next session. This will be the third session of the day. Uh, on this session, we will specifically discuss about nutrition, especially in the critical care setting. So uh, the title of the session is the Preserving the Quality of Life Nutrition Therapy for Critically Ill Patients. I would like to thank President News Kabi Indonesia for supporting this session. Uh, for this session, we have one speaker, Professor Jonathan Asper. He will discuss about the bridging the protein calorie gap to improve outcomes in surgery and the ICU. And this session will be led by Dr. Vera Irawan. Dr. Vera, please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Krisa. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay, in this session, this is an industrial session that uh, was sponsored by Fresenius Kabi. I would like to thanks to all the Fresenius Kabi management. Uh, and now uh, we are uh, introducing one distinguished speaker. I will introduce Professor Jonathan Asper. He is a colorectal surgeon. Uh, he has uh, more than 25 years experience, of course, in surgical and also he's a one of the pioneer of clinical nutrition. He has a, sur uh, he has a basic, uh, uh, basic surgical training at Santo Thomas Hospital in Manila, Philippines, and then a uh, uh, rectal fellowship in university, uh, JK University uh, Hospital in Tokyo, and also Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. And we know he is one of pioneer in clinical nutrition. He was. He is also a founding president of Philspan, uh, that's Philippine Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, and also an active member of Pensa, Aspen, and Aspen. Now we know he is a medical director of Freshness Gabi and continues to lead uh, education and research in clinical nutrition. Maybe some of us uh, have, have uh, read the, his publication. Okay, hello, uh, Professor Asper, how are you? <laughs> I think I've uh, last met you at FCCM at PRA, yeah? But due to COVID, uh, we haven't seen each other for three years almost, yeah? Okay. Uh, for a uh, background, maybe for introduction, many of us in clinical setting, uh, questionings, sometimes we have a patient, like why my patient uh, readmitted to ICU, maybe after discharge from uh, uh, abdominal surgery like that. And then uh, we were pretty sure that when the patient discharged, the patient were uh, or fine in a good condition. And then after several days or several weeks, the patient admit, admit to ICU with severe infection or septic shock. And then we are questioning what's happened to the patient. Or sometimes we uh, several uh, found ICU survivor, they complain of uh, fatigue or they are not able to do uh, physical activity after uh, hospitalized in uh, hospital or in ICU. So is this problem due to uh, our management in nutrition? So let's uh, we invite Professor Jonathan Asperer with the theme, the bridging the calorie protein gap to improve outcome in surgery and ICU patient. To Professor Jonathan Asper, the time is, is yours. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to the organizers for this invitation. And thank you to all of you in the audience for your interest. It would have been great to come to Indonesia, but since that is not possible, please allow me to share with you my lecture online. You know, today there are so many new developments in perioperative medicine that it becomes 
easy to lose sight of a very important aspect of perioperative care, which is nutrition. And so today, I would like to talk to you about such basic matters as surgical catabolism, muscle mass, and wound healing. They may not sound so exciting, but they are very important in the collaboration between the anesthesia and surgical teams. Therefore, in the next few minutes, I will discuss surgical catabolism, the impact of malnutrition and sarcopenia on surgical and critical care outcomes, and the essentials of perioperative nutrition care, especially focusing on the timing and route of nutrition, as well as the role of the immunonutrients, glutamine and fish oil. Due to limited time, I will try to balance the latest publications with some practical guidance. In response to injury, a neuroendocrine response stimulates mobilization of energy reserves from the liver that makes glucose available as a transient energy source endogenously for up to three days. When the endogenous stores are depleted, the body will then turn to whole body protein catabolism. Unless timely and ad adequate nutrition support is provided. This whole body protein catabolism or muscle breakdown results in a loss of amino acids with considerable amounts of glutamine, a very important amino acid. And I will come back to this later as we go along. Meanwhile, the impact of malnutrition on surgical outcomes is manifested as problems of wound healing, impaired immune defense, and decreased muscle mass. And all of these are recognized to have a profound impact on outcomes in surgery and critical care. Indeed, the impact of malnutrition on surgical outcomes is shown in the studies at the top as significant risk for longer hospital length of stay, higher cost of care, and severe post-op complications. And at the bottom, as increased mortality at 28 days and even up to 20 or 12 months following surgery. Here we see that protein catabolism and loss of muscle mass can be harmful. At the top is a study that shows a decrease in the thickness of the diaphragm over just five days on ventilator support, as you can see here. And below that is a publication that shows a decrease in the cross-sectional area of the thigh muscle, amounting to close to 20% loss within a period of just 10 days. This is significant because it is associated with decreased wound healing, increased muscle weakness, and increased risk of infection, not to mention difficulty of weaning from ventilator support. It is clear that the loss of muscle mass or sarcopenia correlates with poor survival in ICU patients. Here you can see the measurements of the back muscles showing an association with mortality this lowest percentile of back muscle thickness shown in red, indicating the greatest level of sarcopenia and association with the poorest survival. On the right, the association is also demonstrated with muscle quality, indicated by the presence of intermuscular fat shown as the green areas on the screens. Sarcopenia is also a major risk factor for poor outcomes in GI surgery. In fact, a huge body of evidence from recent studies shows that sarcopenia is associated with poor outcomes, especially in GI cancer. On the left is a list of meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and on the right are publications focusing on specific cancers from upper to lower GI tract. Indeed, the representative studies on this slide 
show that sarcopenia is associated with poor survival in patients undergoing surgery for esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, periampillary, and colorectal. Now looking at cost of care, we can see that as the psoas muscle area decreases going from left to right, the cost of surgical care also increases dramatically. A more recent review shows how loss of muscle mass or strength through its association with post-op complications, longer hospital stay, increased length of hospital stay, more admissions to ICU, lead similarly to an increase in cost of care. Indeed, a report in the Journal of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition shows that nutrition therapy can significantly reduce Medicare spending by millions of dollars in patients with GI cancer who experience surgical complications. From this recent pharmacoeconomic analysis of cost of care in Asian hospitals, including Indonesia, we can see that the annual economic burden associated with hospital malnutrition is over 30 billion US dollars. With the greatest cost incurred for longer length of stay in hospital and infectious complications. So in practical terms, what can be done in the collaboration between anesthesiologists and surgeons? On this slide, you see Professor Arvid Weiman, lead author of the 2017 ESPEN guidelines for nutrition in surgery, as he presented some highlights during the Frank Asia in 2017 in Bali. Talking about the indications, route, and timing of nutrition therapy in surgical patients, these guidelines have been updated with a more practical approach just last year in 2021, as you can see here. The first step is critical for the anesthesia team because nutrition screening and assessment should routinely be included in the preoperative evaluation along with the ASA classification and all the other medical risk factors. High risk in nutrition is associated or indicated by at least one of the four criteria listed here. NRS score more than five, weight loss greater than 10%, BMI less than 18.5, and albumin lower than 30. In high-risk patients, elective surgery should be postponed, and nutrition therapy with preoperative care, including prehabilitation, should be implemented. High risk should be interpreted to mean not only risk of malnutrition, but also risk of malnutrition-related complications. Therefore, sound clinical judgment should always be exercised considering the magnitude and severity and complexity of the surgical procedure and the patient's physiologic reserve and the patient's capacity to handle a second hit. What about indicators of efficacy or endpoints for nutrition therapy? As an acute phase reactant influenced by inflammation and other factors, Albumin has no value in measuring adequacy of nutrition support. This is more appropriately addressed by monitoring actual intake from day to day. This is called uh, the nutrient monitoring, which is also sometimes called the calorie count when referred to by dietitians. Delivery of 75 to 80% in both calorie and protein targets over at least one week can be considered adequate preoperative nutrition optimization. When available, hand grip dynamometry is also acceptable to assess muscle strength. Routine screening and intervention is important because routine, because protein calorie deficits are associated with worse outcomes in critical surgical illness. And the greater the deficits, 
the poorer the outcomes, as shown here for in-hospital mortality, 30-day mortality, and so on down the line for all the other clinical outcomes shown in this study from Boston. This has also been shown in non-surgical critical illness, and I'm showing you on this slide nine studies, two of them from Asia at the bottom, showing that protein calorie deficits, especially early in the course of the ICU stay, are associated with increased mortality and morbidity. In fact, the third study from Israel, Pierre Singer's group, shows us that a cumulative calorie deficit of just 4,000 kilocalories can put ICU patients at risk for increased infectious complications. In Asia, a 4,000 kilocalorie deficit can mean just two or three days of not, meet, not meeting calorie protein requirements. The United for Clinical Nutrition Initiative, Nutrition Insights Day, was an observational study that focused on the incidence of malnutrition in 536 patients undergoing major abdominal surgery in seven Asian countries, including Indonesia, and showing that the risk of malnutrition was moderate to high at 54% and concluding that there is a high prevalence of post-operative nutritional deficits in Asian hospitals. This highlights the importance of some updated concepts regarding calories and protein. As you know, the recommendation for calories is 25 to 30 kilocalories. This key study suggests that targeting 80 to 100% of calorie requirements yields the best results. We can call this the target zone. It's like the sweet spot in tennis or golf for those of you who are into sports. With both underfeeding and overfeeding, as you can see here, apparently being harmful for the patient. Whereas for protein, which has a recommendation of 1.3 to 1.5 grams per kilo per day, Providing higher protein, moving from left to right, confers an additional mortality benefit with every additional gram of protein increasing survival by 1%, even when the protein delivery exceeds the actual protein requirement of 100%. Let's look at what the new guidelines of 2019 from the S Pen ICU guidelines say. The concept mainly is that of tailoring feeding to the phase of critical illness. Here we can see that the phases of feeding are divided into the early acute phase, which is before day three, and after day three, the late acute phase, progressing later on in the first week into the recovery phase. What is important to note from here is that If oral feeding is possible to start with oral feeding, even in the acute early phase, and as you go into the late acute phase, increase oral diet, checking adequacy and combining with EN or PN if needed. What about if there are, if, there, if oral diet is contraindicated and there are no contraindications to EN, then the recommendation is to start low-dose enteral nutrition in the early acute phase and then ramp up in the late acute phase, hoping to reach a target of at least 100% of the energy requirements and 1.3 grams per kilo per day of protein. There's a, there's a recommendation to supplement with PN if the target is not reached. And speaking more about PN, If there is a contraindication to enteral nutrition and there is malnutrition, then the patient should start low-dose PN already in the early acute phase and gradually increase if the oral diet or enteral nutrition is still not possible, checking daily if oral or enteral nutrition is, becomes possible or tolerated. Early enteral nutrition initiated within 24 hours 
can confer significant non-nutritional benefits such as enhanced GI motility. And here we need to pay attention to judicious intraoperative fluid management to minimize bowel edema and promote bowel function, the use of prokinetics and bypassing any gastric ileus with jejunal feeding, preferably with a continuous pump infusion for better metabolic tolerance and less vomiting, aspiration, and diarrhea. What about PN? Here are some tips for initiating PN in a hemodynamically stable patient with normal or corrected electrolyte and acid-base balance and the baseline metabolic profile using all-in-one bags and micronutrients as additives. Watch out for refeeding syndrome. This is a potentially lethal condition resulting from the neuromuscular cardiac dysfunction triggered by electrolyte imbalance as the patient shifts abruptly from the lipid metabolism of starvation to the glucose metabolism of feeding. It's important to actively seek for a history of recent weight loss or semi-starvation and carefully monitor and replace electrolytes, especially phosphates, magnesium, and potassium, and to correct deficits, including thiamine. Start below 50% of the calorie target and gradually progress as electrolytes continue to be monitored and corrected. Data from the UCN study demonstrated that considering the route of nutrition delivery, the smallest percentage of patients with calorie deficits and with protein deficits here on the right, were the patients receiving combined enteral and parenteral nutrition, as you can see here, compared to patients receiving EN alone or PN alone in both calorie and protein groups. The practical value of this finding using combined EN and PN provide the non-nutritional benefits of early EN, which I mentioned earlier, such as improved gut immunity and function, while use of PN makes it possible to achieve the protein calorie targets despite any GI intolerance associated with post-op uh, conditions or critical illness. Now let's look at the issue of providing protein of, or rather of improving protein anabolism. From the left in red, we can see the catabolic factors that lead to muscle wasting, including inflammation. And from the right in blue, we can see the anabolic factors that lead to muscle gain or at least maintenance. Clearly the anabolic factors are related to protein synthesis. Obviously, the first is availability of protein, adequate protein, from either EN or PN, and the use of glutamine to complete the amino acid profile. Next is, is some kind of physical therapy with exercise to stimulate protein synthesis. And last but not least, pharmaconutrition or pharmaconutrients specifically looking at omega-3, indicated by this red arrow, which is important not only for resolution of inflammation, which you can see here is a catabolic factor, but also for directly improving protein synthesis and minimizing protein breakdown. Let me explain that a little bit more. Omega-3 can also promote protein synthesis and minimize protein breakdown. EPA and DHA enrichment shows you on the left that the cell membrane uptake of leucine and other amino acids into the mTOR C1 pathway can be improved to promote protein synthesis. While at the center, you can see that the uh, specialized pro-resolving mediators, resolvins, protectins, and maricins, can reduce inflammation, also leading to improved protein synthesis. 
while on the right, you can see that uh, free EPA and DHA here in the red boxes can block the undesirable pro-inflammatory actions of NF-kappa B that lead to protein breakdown, as you can see here. In support of this concept, here's a study from Japan that shows the benefits of fish oil and rich nutrition in cachectic GI cancer patients receiving chemotherapy. In the blue box, you can see that the patients receiving fish oil compared to controls below showed no increase in inflammation as indicated by stable CRP levels, whereas there's an increase in inflammation in the controls together with increases in skeletal muscle mass and lean body mass with the benefit observed from baseline to three months to six months. On the right is a similar study looking at EPA and rich nutrition given during neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy for pancreatic cancer. Once again, we can see that there is a benefit in the EPA group in the blue squares. And this benefit is dose related where you can see that the patients who receive more than 50% of the dose have a better amount of muscle mass compared to the patients who received less than 50% of the dose. Here is a recent meta-analysis from 2020 that shows that muscle mass can be improved as well as muscle performance with the use of omega-3 in sarcopenia. The authors present us with this chart that suggests the beneficial impact of omega-3 fatty acids on muscle is to modulate the inflammation and to improve muscle skeletal muscle protection, resulting in improved muscle mass, improved muscle strength, and improved muscle performance, particularly in the patients in the elderly page, age group. This is a more recent publication from Clinical Nutrition SPEN, just October 2021, showing similar benefits for omega-3 supplementation with a benefit for the effect size for lean body mass, skeletal muscle mass, as well as for muscle performance measured by quadriceps maximum voluntary capacity. Now let's look at another aspect of fish oil. Inflammation is a beneficial physiologic response when it is within the physiologic range here but it becomes harmful when exaggerated, both as overwhelming inflammation leading to organ failure or as immune paralysis leading to breakdown of host defense. The importance of omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, is to modulate this exaggerated response and bring it closer to the physiologic range where it becomes beneficial. This action is attributed to resolvins, protectins, and myrosins, the so-called specialized pro-inflammatory mediators from EPA and DHA that bring about resolution of inflammation that has also been demonstrated in viral infections. This is important to know in the time of COVID. How does this happen? After omega-3 supplementation, and enrichment of the cell membranes in the biphospholipid cell membranes, you can see that the omega-3 displaces the omega-6, which then become uh, decreased in levels. And the decreased levels of omega-6 will then lead to a block in the metabolism to NF-kappa B. On the other hand, when omega-3, EPA, DPA, DHA become incorporated in the cell membranes, through the action of enzyme systems, you then have the three that will be acted on by lipoxygenases to bring about the SPMs, the specialized pro-resolving mediators, resolvins, protectins, and myrosins, which will also exert a blocking action on the NF-kappa-B pro-inflammatory cytokine production, leading to prevention of cytokine storm. In addition, aside from their anti-inflammatory mechanisms 
shown here below and which I talked about in the previous slide. Omega-3 fatty acids also exert a direct antiviral effect by enhancing the phagocytic activity of neutrophils and macrophages to fight the viral invasion. Based on preclinical and clinical studies, this slide shows the potential role of SPMs in sepsis and critical illness, listing the different bioactive lipid mediators derived from omega-3 and their respective actions on increased bacterial appearance and sepsis survival, protection from ARDS and lung injury, as well as neuroprotection and cardiac repair. In addition, here are two studies from the U.S. on the left and from Chile on the right, both countries having experienced large numbers of COVID patients, showing an inverse relationship between the omega-3 index, which is the level of omega-3 in the blood, and the severity of COVID illness. In particular, omega-3 index were associated with decreased mortality shown in both studies, U.S. and Chile, but in addition to that, in the study from Chile, you can see benefits of a better response to mechanical ventilation or better um, pulmonary function. This 2020 recommendation from SPEN experts detailed the nutritional recommendations in COVID-19 critical illness. They're pretty similar to what I mentioned earlier for non-COVID critical illness, but here we see a clear message to include omega-3 fatty acids in both EN and PN solutions. In addition, confirmation of the clinical benefits of omega-3 can be seen in this recent meta-analysis on PN with omega-3 in surgical and ICU patients with 49 randomized controlled trials and over 3,600 patients showing significant reductions in both hospital and ICU length of stay, as well as significant reductions in sepsis, 56% reduction, as well as in infection rate, where you have a 40% reduction in relative risk of infection. Meanwhile, there have been concerns about the risk for bleeding with the use of fish oil in nutrition therapy. Here we see a bunch of studies that have shown that in the therapeutic doses, we do not see any such occurrence of abnormal bleeding. The OPERA study on the right looked specifically at perioperative bleeding in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And we can see surprisingly that patients in the fish oil group had actually lower blood transfusion requirements than the patients in the control group. In fact, the SPEN guidelines do recommend the use of omega-3 parenteral nutrition when PN is required in the post-op period. Now let's shift gears a bit and look at glutamine, considered to be a ubiquitous amino acid, normally produced in the body and a preferred fuel for rapidly proliferating cells like the immune cells and enterocytes. However, glutamine levels become depleted during catabolism, as I mentioned at the beginning. Here, inclusion of glutamine into nutrition can complete the amino acid profile for optimal protein synthesis. In catabolic conditions like major surgery or critical illness, glutamine, a conditionally essential amino acid, becomes depleted, as you can see here. And the important physiologic functions of glutamine in the blue box are lost together with the corresponding clinical benefits in the red box, which include antioxidative capacity, cellular defense mechanisms, intestinal barrier function, immune competence, cellular energy supply, and breakdown of muscle mass. All of these leading to an increased mortality. Glutamine supplementation is associated with important outcomes, such as improved outcomes in surgery and critical illness, including improved wound healing, gut immunity, microbiome, insulin sensitivity, and glucose homeostasis. Furthermore, 
using glutamine in parenteral nutrition helps to prevent glutamine from being the rate limiting step in protein synthesis. Here, this recent review summarizes the clinical benefits of glutamine provision in trauma, burns, and surgery, focusing on its important role in immune defense, in protection of the microbiome, in cell and organ protection via mechanisms of heat shock protein, as well as in improving protein synthesis and healing, as you can see here. Despite all this information, there may be some lingering hesitation to use glutamine in ICU patients because of the uh, REDOX trial, but you should not be concerned about that because on the left, in the green box, we can see the established use of glutamine according to guidelines and within the recommended dose. Redox, on the other hand, used glutamine as an off-label indication, entirely different from previously published trials. And in fact, you can see that um, no nutrition was required. Glutamine was given apart from nutrition, independent of nutrition, to very critically ill patients, and the SMPC or package instructions indicate that uh, renal failure or hepatic failure are contraindications, but in fact, one third of patients had renal failure. And you can see that the doses of glutamine that were delivered were extremely high. Lastly, the patient populations were quite different. So you can see that in, in uh, today's practice, if you look at standard randomized controlled trials or traditional standard RCTs on glutamine, where glutamine was used according to the guidelines, you can see benefits in infectious complications, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, duration of mechanical ventilation, and even in hospital mortality. This more recent publication from just last year is an overview of systematic reviews. And while there seems to be a lack of clarity on routine use of glutamine in uh, use in selected patients, particularly patients undergoing surgery, as you can see here, surgical patients, you can see, a benef you can see benefits of decreased infectious complications and shortened hospital length of stay. Indeed, the S Pen guidelines also recommend the use of glutamine supplementation when PN is required in the post op period. Here I show you a slide which looks rather busy. This is the um, depiction of bioenergetic mitochondrial processes, including the Krebs cycle over here, just to impress upon you that all of the um, Vitamins, minerals, trace elements, which you can see on the left over here, are involved with many of the processes included in mitochondrial function, and that the absence or lack of these additives can result in mitochondrial dysfunction, which can be um, harmful and can impede recovery. And an important point is that microsupplementation probably requires a strategic cocktail rather than high doses of a single nutrient. On this page, um, you know that uh, Professor Metaberger has been very passionate about lecturing on vitamins and trace elements. We can see here a list of vitamins and trace elements. And on the left, in the blue circles, we can see the antioxidant and immune defense mechanisms, the energy and substrate metabolism areas in which these vitamins and trace elements are active and it becomes very clear that they are indeed important. So looking more closely, this is again a 2020 publication looking at optimal immune response during times of infection. And you can see I've summarized, enlarged and summarized the slide here. You can see that the micronutrients are essential for optimal immune response as far as integrity, of physical barriers, oxidative burst, and self-protection, 
innate immune cell proliferation, differentiation, et cetera, antimicrobial activity, regulation of inflammation, T cell proliferation and differentiation function, antibody production and function, and cell mediated immunity. So it's important to consider to use vitamins, minerals, and trace elements when long-term PN is delivered. I have come to the end of my talk and in closing, I hope I have convinced you that it is absolutely essential to integrate nutrition screening and assessment into the routine preoperative evaluation. And when malnutrition or malnutrition risk is found, timely and adequate delivery of protein and calories should be initiated, preferably starting pre-op with uh, prehabilitation. Here you can see also that early EN and early supplemental PN are effective in preventing protein calorie deficits. Also be aware that protein targets can be achieved with high protein formulations, as well as including glutamine to complete the amino acid profile and fish oil because of the benefits in improving protein synthesis. Exercise and muscle training, although I didn't have much time to talk about this, are also important factors which constitute the principles of prehabilitation. Also, finally, consider glutamine and the omega-3 fatty acids together with additives, vitamins, minerals, and trace elements to maximize efficacy of nutrition therapy. Ladies and gentlemen, it would have been great to come to Indonesia, but since that is not possible. I hope that my sharing today uh, will be useful in your clinical practice. I am a surgeon. My wife is an anesthesiologist. And please believe me when I say that collaboration between the an anesthesia team and the surgical team is of vital importance to improve patients' outcomes. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. Thank you very much, Professor Asprar, for your brief presentation. It uh, brings us a wide horizon about the nutrition uh, therapy or nutrition support in critical ill patients, uh, and the, it's beneficial for the patients. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes for answering the question, Prof. Uh, okay, the first, I will, the first question, uh, as the uh, as an anesthesiologist, uh, we had only limited time to optimize nutrition status uh, preoperatively. What can we do in this such short time? Um, please. Yes, uh, that's an important question. When once we decide to give preoperative nutrition, it is because of malnutrition, pre-existing malnutrition, or risk for complications associated with malnutrition. Therefore, it means that if we do not have enough time to optimize the nutrition support, if we have less than a week and due to some uh, urgent situation, the patients need to be taken to the operating room, then uh, we have to do that. We cannot delay further because of the emergent nature of the surgery, but our surgical decision-making needs to be tempered by the realization that because of the uh, nutrition risk associated with uh, risk from malnutrition complications, we have to be very careful about deciding on the surgical procedure. If the patient is unlikely to be able to withstand a second hit, I would hesitate to perform, for example, a primary resection and uh, rather a resection and primary anastomosis and rather exteriorize or have a stage procedure until we can optimize the patient's uh, nutritional condition. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, the second question is, uh, what about the micronutrient? Is there any recommendation you have just uh, give the yeah. brief uh, about the micronutrient, but they ask about the recommendation yes. for supplementation. Yeah. Yes, well, in patients receiving partial, you know, combined enteral and parenteral nutrition, it's not so important. But in patients who are receiving exclusive parenteral nutrition, then it becomes very important to include the additives because 
Without the micronutrients, you have mitochondrial dysfunction and the calories and protein that we provide cannot be utilized efficiently. Okay, uh, the next question uh, about the omega-3. What's the recommendation dose for, for the omega-3? Because we know the beneficial effect is so many. So our, the do, how much we could give the patient uh, for omega-3 supplement? Well, the doses have been studied to be 0.1 to 0.2 grams per kilo per day. However, when I talk about fish oil or omega-3 in nutrition, I mean in the context of nutrition therapy or in the context of enteral or parenteral nutrition. That means that we do not, um, for example, prescribe fish oil capsules, but instead when the patient requires nutrition, then we select an EN or PN formulation that contains fish oil in the amount which is useful and necessary to reach this dose in the patients. Okay. Okay, and then uh, this one uh, question about pediatric. Is there any recommendation for uh, pedi pediatric ICU patient? Uh, is it uh, similar with the adults or any specific recommendation, Prof? Uh, the pediatricians always tell us that uh, the child is not a miniature adult. So it, the differences are several. And uh, the biggest difference is, uh, whereas in adults, all-in-one all in one industrial or commercial bags are um, recommended, in the case of pediatric patients, you need to, to be concerned about uh, the dose according to their um, changing requirements. You know that very young, very low birth weight um, neonates or premature Babies have very high calorie requirements, and therefore um, it's more important or it's more appropriate to compound for these babies. And when I say compound, it's, it's actually individualizing or tailoring the dose to the specific needs of these little babies. Um, that's one. The other thing is to consider what is the need for nutrition in, in um, pediatric patient. Is it because of massive bowel resection? Of maybe from necrotizing enterocolitis, now the patient has short bowel syndrome, intestinal failure, and needs long-term PN? Or is the patient a, um, a premature baby or very low birth weight baby in the NICU? Then the situation is quite different. But um, for long-term, if you use fish oil as part of the um, nutrition solution, then the liver function uh, improves and the liver function is preserved for a longer period of time. For shorter term use, um, you also have the importance of the anti-inflammatory and modulation effect of fish oil. So you can also use it in or consider it for both types of patients. Okay, thank you. Uh... Maybe this last question. Uh, I want to ask about uh, monitoring muscle strain in ICU. Uh, you, you mentioned about hand grip uh, muscle strain, yeah? But yeah. if we, uh, we don't have any tools to or for objectively um, uh, uh, monitor the muscle, any recommendation uh, how we uh, daily to day to, day to uh, monitor this patient? Is there any muscle weakness or uh, decreasing of muscle, muscle mass? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's easier to measure in patients who are conscious because in the absence of the hand grip dynamometer, by the way, I just learned it's not that expensive. I mean, we used to think um, some years back that it was too expensive, but it's, for example, in Hong Kong, it's just around 300 Hong Kong dollars. Oh, okay. that's, not, that's not a very large amount. Um, but anyway, you can, when you greet your patient, you can ask the patient to squeeze your hand, conscious patient. And on the non-dominant hand, you can sort of assess the patient's strength. The other way is uh, for a patient who has, uh, or who is on ventilator support and has come out of it, then you can look at the um, strength of the respiratory muscles 
either by using pulmonary function tests, uh, which you would use in, in evaluating uh, readiness for extubation or weaning from extubation, for example, or it's simply with the, um, you know, when we, were, when we were younger residents, we used to ask simply the patient to breathe in and out with um, an, a spir simple spirometer, then that can also give you an indication of muscle strength. You know, we Asians have to be very resourceful. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we are, have a limited resource, Prof. Okay, thank you very much for your sharing and for experience. Uh, it's amazing, wonderful. And then uh, maybe it's, uh, I can conclude that uh, monitoring, uh, nutrition assessment, and also nutrient monitoring is a, are crucial for uh, managing a critical patient. And then optimizing nutrition and early intervention uh, with adequate uh, nutrition with protein, uh, lipid, and micronutrient, it will improve our patient outcomes. Thank you, Professor, uh, for joining us in Indo Anesthesia. Hope to see you soon uh, after this COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll bring it back to Dr. Krisa. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. And thank, thank you, Dr. Me. Vera, for leading the discussion. Prof, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's late at your time now, right? It's in the middle of the night. <laughs> thank you very much thank for you, staying up with us. Uh, Hi, Dr. And... Reddy. Hello, Prof. Well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. We're thank honored you. to have you. <laughs> and I would like to thank also present News Kabi for sponsoring this session. Uh, and for the next uh, session, we have one of the most Makati, important yeah. <laughs> of the Indonesia. Uh, we will have the music. <laughs> Prof, if, you, if it's not too late, you can enjoy the music after this by Dr. Susilo and his colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.